Hello. Today we talk about Karl von Clausewitz, the great Prussian philosopher of war. Uh, he is an appropriate subject for our talk following the last one on Thucydides. There are quite striking parallels between the two men and their lives. Uh, both were fascinated by war. Uh, both lived through what were the greatest wars of their era, the Peloponnesian Wars for Thucydides and the French and Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars for Clausewitz. Uh, both were actively engaged in military campaigns. Uh, Thucydides uh, was uh, briefly a general and unsuccessfully so. Uh, Clausewitz rose to the rank of general. Uh, both men were captured by the enemy and spent time in their territory. Thucydides was a guest of Sparta for several years and observed the war closely from uh, that perspective. Clausewitz uh, was captured and spent time in France in uh, Soissons and Nancy and six weeks on leave in Paris. He learned French, he engaged in extensive uh, conversations with uh, French uh, thinkers and political and military officials. Uh, both men were frustrated in the sense that they were excluded from the central circles of policy making where they felt they belonged. Both men died before they finished their respective magnum opus. And finally, uh, both men shared the fate of being seriously misread by those who came after them. I noted in my previous talk uh, about how realists uh, distorted and misread Thucydides. Uh, the same is true of Clausewitz, although here the guilty party and not the realists, but the generals and strategic thinkers uh, who took bits of tactics and strategies from Clausewitz, uh, missing his overall more important uh, military and political points. Um, Clausewitz was uh, born into a not very wealthy provincial family. Uh, he and his brother were both sent into the army. Uh, Karl, believe it or not, uh, entered at the age of 12 where fairly soon uh, he was thrust into battle as part of the uh, Duke of Brunswick's uh, army that attempted unsuccessfully to invade uh, France in the War of the First Coalition. Uh, they were repulsed. Uh, Clausewitz had the opportunity to observe how the French army uh, relied heavily on skirmishes. These are people who uh, fanned out, uh, took cover, uh, fired at will, and were very effective both because of their cover uh, and their willingness to face death. Uh, they in fact survived in higher rates than the armies they fought against who were organized in traditional squares and offered uh, wonderful targets uh, to those who could lie down and focus their rifles uh, on them. Prussian, Austrian and other armies uh, didn't fight the way the French did uh, in part because of uh, their rigid belief in authoritarian leadership by aristocrats and peasants and secondly because these conscripts or mercenaries really had very little uh, desire to fight as opposed to serve and draw pay and their armies would dissipate uh, if they were allowed out of uh, formation. 
So the French had a real advantage. Clausewitz came to understand very early on that the key to French victory lay with the French Revolution, with its transformation of the country, its involvement in people in the French cause, their willingness to fight uh, and to die, uh, to advance that cause, which made it possible uh, for Napoleon, admittedly a military genius, uh, to have this subtle weapon uh, to run rings around his more traditional adversaries. Uh, Clausewitz later served in the uh, campaign of 1806 when Napoleon invaded Prussia and decisively defeated Prussia in the famous battles of Jena and Auerstadt. Uh, Clausewitz uh, organized uh, cleverly a defense, uh, repulsed three cavalry charges before he and his 300 grenadiers surrounded by three <laughs> French regiments were forced to surrender. Uh, this is when he ended up spending his time in France. Uh, later he helped to organize uh, new armies in East Prussia to carry on the resistance against France, but at the Treaty of Tilsit, the King of Prussia, Frederick, made peace with Napoleon, as did the Russians initially, and Clausewitz and a number of his friends were infuriated uh, because uh, they had become uh, Prussian nationalists. They thought giving in to France was unacceptable, resigned their commissions in the Prussian army, undertook service for Russia. Uh, Clausewitz took part in the Russian retreat, uh, urged uh, uh, Kutuzov and others to uh, follow a scorched earth policy to deprive the French of any resources they would need the deeper they were drawn into Russia. He fought at the Battle of Borodino, uh, the greatest of battles between the French and the Russians. He helped pursue uh, the retreating French, was instrumental in having General York, a Prussian general, uh, change uh, sides, basically defect with the Prussian army or part of it to the Russian side. Prussia in turn then uh, switched sides as well. Uh, Napoleon was consistently now on the run and as you probably know was defeated and isolated on the Isle of Elba but then returned for his famous hundred days which ended in the Battle of Waterloo. Uh, here too Clausewitz played a major role. Um, he was in charge of a cavalry corps at this point and resisted uh, successfully three cavalry charges <coughs> uh, under the leadership <coughs> excuse me <coughs> of General uh, uh, Emmanuel de Grouchy and tied down uh, the Prussian army that he was with tied down uh, one-third of the French forces, keeping them from participating in the main engagement at Waterloo. So an illustrious career, uh, but one in which he nevertheless was kept from high places uh, despite the desire of his mentor uh, Scharnhorst to uh, uh, make him central to the Prussian military effort. Uh, because his defection to Russia stuck in the craw of the Prussian king. <clears throat> he was never forgiven for it. He was only belatedly made a general. He was denied a Medal of Honor uh, that Scharnhorst had uh, recommended him for because of his uh, bravery. Now, um, one of the turning points in Clausewitz's life was as a young man. <clears throat> 
after the war of the first coalition. Uh, Scharnhaus was uh, given the task of establishing a military academy, the Kriegs Academy in Berlin. Clausewitz was one of the students in the first class. They were exposed not only to all the engineering and technical military education, but Scharnhaus insisted to history, literature, philosophy. He acquired, as a result, a much broader um, education, an education that made him think about war uh, in less narrow technical terms, but as a clash between societies uh, in which um, ideology and moral commitment uh, counted as much as physical uh, capabilities. Scharnhaus also inspired in him uh, the study of history. And before producing his great work, Van Kriege, on, on war, he wrote uh, histories of the uh, Swedish involvement under Gustavus Adolphus in the uh, religious wars of the 17th century. Uh, he wrote about uh, Frederick the Great, and of course he wrote about what had happened in the Napoleonic Wars, which he had observed um, firsthand. The lesson, too, really, that he drew from these writings were, in the first place, that uh, War was a clash of wills that involved emotions, moral qualities, leadership, that it was uh, different from uh, any kind of science. Uh, it could not be reduced to mathematical formulae. Uh, one might come up with some kind of abstract understanding of war, but it was only a starting point for telling a narrative which built in features of context. Uh, he also understood how much the conduct of war reflected the character of a society. And he sought to somehow reconcile his understanding or his desire to understand war in theory with his deep understanding of how the practice of war was very different. Here, um, Clausewitz was influenced by both the Enlightenment and the Counter-Enlightenment. Uh, he was a transitional figure in this respect and, of course, born at the right moment uh, to do so. He was a product of the Enlightenment in his search for um, abstract, rational understandings of human behavior. But he was a product of the counter-enlightenment with his emphasis on uh, human emotions, passions, and the polarities of life. And here he's a, a reader of Goethe who very much stresses this. And these polarities that uh, can't be reconciled but must somehow be superseded in any understanding that offers a holistic account of uh, social activities and human life. His uh, writings went through numerous drafts as he uh, struggled to figure out how to cope <coughs> with these understandings that pulled him in very different uh, directions. Uh, he never finished uh, his work. Uh, fortunately, uh, Marie van Brühl, uh, his wife, was a woman of remarkable intelligence with whom he had uh, discussed his uh, work at some length. Uh, she had significant input in it, together with an officer friend, O. Etzel, pulled together the writings in the form of a book that was published posthumously. Clausewitz dying in 1831, uh, stationed in uh, Poland to put down 
Polish Revolution against the Prussians of a cholera epidemic. Scharnholz uh, also succumbed. <coughs> now, when we turn to his uh, great text on uh, war, uh, the key, I think, for understanding it is the dialectic. Now, the dialectic originates with uh, Plato, but was very much revived by Kant and central to all German idealist thinkers, especially Hegel, uh, for whom it was the force that drove history forward. Uh, Kant and Hegel conceive of it uh, in metaphysical terms and think of there being a thesis and antithesis, which its opposite, the two of them in tension producing a synthesis. Uh, Karl Marx would uh, also uh, embed his theory in the dialectic. Uh, feudalism gave rise to the very conditions which undermined it, which produced a synthesis, which was capitalism. That process happened again, uh, leading to socialism. Clausewitz, who rejected metaphysics entirely unobservables, believed in the state, but not as something that had ethical or historical uh, uh, conditions and principles embodied in it. Uh, he saw the state as a human creation, a political organization, that when it functioned, enabled human beings to pursue their goals and become human in ways that were not otherwise possible. He was a nationalist, but not uh, a believer in the mission of states in general. And the same with the dialectic. Uh, for him, it was a means of organizing his argument, which is very different from using it as the central engine of historical development. For Clausewitz, the thesis was war in theory. And this is in chapter one, his famous abstract characterization of war as a duel. It's a clash of wills between political units in which violence is used until the other side is defeated. Uh, this is refined in book one and elsewhere to relate the use of force to the political goals uh, sought by the state and its leaders. Force is used to bend or break the will of an adversary, uh, to make it accept political demands that it would not otherwise agree to. Why does this work? Because once you defeat an army or occupy its territory or deprive the army of the supplies it needs to continue in the field, you lay open the prospect of occupying more of the country, of removing its economic resources for your ends, and thus punishing the country in a way that would be greater than giving in to what it is you want. Uh, so there has to be a rather fine connection and calibration between the kind and degree of force that's used against an adversary and the political goals that are being sought. And here Clausewitz uh, distinguished among three kinds of war. Uh, the first, a limited war. A state, for example, uh, wants to uh, conquer and annex a territory that belongs to a neighboring state. This is in sharp contrast to a total war where it seeks to do away with the state entirely or overthrow its leaders and change its political regime. The degree of force required in these two separate uh, kinds of war is very different. 
The third sort of war he called People's War. He used uh, Spain as his example where guerrilla forces uh, rose to fight uh, against the French army of occupation, tying down larger and larger numbers of French forces, ultimately uh, defeated by the advent of uh, Wellington and the British in Portugal, but assisted and made possible by guerrilla actions behind the lines in Spain. And he describes uh, guerrillas as people who don't have the capability to field an army that would defeat their adversary. So instead, uh, live among the people, come together for short periods of time to achieve majorities or surprise against local forces and then melt back into the landscape uh, again. And fighting this kind of war on both sides is a very different uh, dynamic. For Clausewitz now, uh, any leader has to have an understanding of war in theory to be able to uh, conduct a war successfully. Um, however, war in practice is very different. It's very different for two reasons. The first is that emotions become engaged. Once people are fighting and dying, that they develop hatred for their adversaries. Uh, they want revenge. The more populations make sacrifices, the more they demand in rewards. So war aims constantly escalate. What might have started as a limited war could transform itself into a general war. Regardless of what leaders think, uh, these kinds of conflicts uh, are very difficult to control. You open a Pandora's box, so to speak, once you draw the sword. So war in practice tends towards the extreme, regardless of the political aims of leaders. The second principle is friction. Uh, friction works in the opposite direction. It's everything that happens that prevents war from becoming uh, efficient and larger in scale. Clausewitz uh, gives examples of cavalry charges that bog down in mud, uh, troops and supplies that arrive late or never arrive, because of problems in transportation due to bad weather or bad directions. Uh, there's misleading intelligence, exhaustion of troops, uh, illness of soldiers and leaders. In other words, everything that can go wrong in war probably will. And it prevents war from escalating, but also keeps leaders <coughs> from carrying out their carefully conceived plans. So, if you remember, I said that uh, Clausewitz, uh, following many counter-enlightenment thinkers, notably Goethe, saw the world as composed of these irreconcilable polarities. Well, war is the same. War in theory and war in practice are two very different things, and they can't really be uh, put together. However, there is a synthesis, and the synthesis is the genius of a leader like Gustavus Adolphus Frederick the Great or Napoleon, who understands war in theory, who never loses sight of the purpose of why he, well, these days he or she, would be fighting a military campaign, but at the same time understands the ways in which the engagement of the, motion, of the emotions threatens loss of control over his military or her military instrument, and how friction interferes with every campaign and effort uh, that the military makes. A genius, and here Clausewitz is relying on Kant, uh, understanding of genius, which is a person who 
creates new rules for doing things, rejects the conventional understandings, uh, sees deeper and more effective ways of acting, as did Gustavus Adolphus and Napoleon. A genius is able to keep focused on the goal of war and at the same time do everything possible to overcome friction. So to bring together as much as possible these two opposing polarities. Uh, Napoleon is a very nice example here. So one of the problems in war is always communication uh, with forces, both in battle and between the campaign headquarters and the armies. Uh, this was a very serious problem, uh, much more so before the invention of <coughs> modern means of communication. Napoleon in Paris set up uh, semaphore signals to communicate with French armies in Italy. So it, they went from one hill or one town to the other and they were relayed and messages went back and forth. It was by no means, as anybody who's played telephone game knows, a perfect means of communication, but it gave them a significant edge uh, on others. And Napoleon's uh, and French forces, because they were committed to what they were doing and because uh, leaders uh, came up from the ranks, they weren't aristocrats, uh, they were promoted if they would perform well, sometimes they were shot if they performed badly. Napoleon had a more effective military instrument. Uh, he could march at night without fear of his forces uh, going off on their own and deserting. Uh, he was able to defeat around Lake Garda two pincers of Austrians coming down either side of the lake by defeating one, marching all night, combating the other. This gave him a mobility that other armies lacked. So Napoleon's genius uh, combined to understand war and also to overcome friction. So Clausewitz was a remarkable theorist um, and one who uh, made arguments very contradictory to the conventional wisdom of the day. Uh, Germany and Bernardi, uh, the other theorists of his era, uh, had mathematical formulations for how you waged war. <coughs> Bernardi uh, made a uh, central to his uh, thesis how close an army was to its supply base and what angle it approached the enemy at, and the closer it was a 90 degree angle, the more likely it was to win victories. Clausus rejected all of this as errant nonsense and offered examples of where armies had acted this way and had lost and had acted in completely opposite ways and had won. Clausewitz also recognized, as I said at the beginning of my talk, the extent to which uh, war was a social phenomenon, and here he was very present. Once Napoleon was finally sent to St. Helena, and many people think uh, poisoned there, Europe breathed a sigh of relief. They thought the genie of total war had been put back in the bottle and the stopper fixed on top, that Europe could go back to the 18th century practice of limited war, and war fought largely by maneuver and outflanking adversaries rather than by real battles. Uh, Clausewitz understood that this was impossible. He worried that in fact a general war was even more likely the extent to which military and political leaders deluded themselves into believing that constrained limited wars were possible. And of course 1914 was proof of his thinking. Everybody thought it would be a short war, yet it escalated out of control for the kinds of reasons that Clausewitz understood. Uh, secondly, Clausewitz understood that the nature of warfare had changed because of developments of modernity, 
uh, and in particular the rise of centralized states and of nationalism. He saw them supportive when the territory of a state overlapped with that of a nationality, but destructive when not. He saw this firsthand in repressing a Polish rebellion against uh, Prussia. He thought that there was no peaceful way of reconciling state interests and the rising nationalism of people within states who wanted states of their own. And here too, uh, he envisaged what was happening in the 20th century. Um, alas, uh, he was read narrowly by uh, generals and strategists who, as I said at the beginning, took tactical and strategic lessons and missed entirely this profound observation about modern warfare uh, and paid a big price for doing this. In conclusion, uh, I would argue that Clausewitz is as relevant to our day uh, as he was to the era of the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, war in theory is still necessary because politics guides war or should guide warfare. It should be, as he put it, uh, an expression of politics by other means. His concept of friction and of escalation through the engagement of emotions is just as relevant as well. One can't help but think that political and military leaders uh, immersed in Clausewitz and understanding his arguments uh, would have been very chary about sending forces into Vietnam, Iraq, or Afghanistan where the military means was inappropriate and even counterproductive to the political ends that were being sought. Thank you.